What's up, guys? So if you haven't been living under a rock for the last, I don't know, four years, which feels like 30, uh, Trump is now two for two with being acquitted by the Senate. And I'm angry, but I'm not surprised. So today we're just going to go over all this and see what's next. So, Drew, how are you today, man? Good, dude. I'm good. Uh, I'm very glad to not be in this massive blizzard snowstorm that I guess... 80% of the country is experiencing. I'm very glad to be in sunny Southern California. Uh, and yeah, let's get into some impeachment because uh, we, um, we've we talked a little bit about it, but we haven't dug into it too much. So I'm kind of ready to get my hands dirty. Yes, sir. And I think they're going to get very dirty in this one. Nice and muddy. And uh, I, I just want to start with this. is There's a, there's a Quinnipiac poll, and I, I probably pronounced that wrong. I can't pronounce it for my life. But the poll of over 1,000 U.S. adults between February 11th and the 14th found that 75% of Republicans think Trump should play a major role in the Republican Party. But now over half of Americans as a whole think he should not be part of the future of the Republican Party. So what's your take on that? What do you think? Um, I think it mirrors what we've been talking about for uh, especially the last few months since November, which is... um, the popularity of Trump in the Republican Party is going to eat its like it's going to eat itself alive, and I, I think we're we're seeing that. I think it's um, it's a it's bad news if you are a Republican strategist to see this still be the case. I think a lot of people, including myself, expected more of a drop off in the popularity of Trump post the election. I think a lot of people were like, I, I figured the Republican Party as a whole would be done with him. Um, that kind of messaging was reflected with uh, Mitch McConnell, who a few weeks ago talked about, you know, um, convicting Trump of 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 insurrection would be a way to get rid of him um, and, you know, get the party to move past him quicker. Um, so there's obviously, you know, I'm not the only person that thought that this might have happened. But in reality, what we've seen is the um, an increasing pattern of the people that are loyal to Trump are doubling down uh, despite the election loss, despite the insurrection on January 6th. Um, Trump Trump heads are staying very Trump. Um, whereas the rest of the country, again, shown by that poll, as well as an ABC poll and a Fox News poll, which I'll pull out in a bit, um, the majority of Americans are not on board with the Trump train, even though those that are on it have doubled down. And it's be causing a very big rift in, I think, public opinion and public perception of this president um and it's making it very hard to unify and and quote unquote move on and we're seeing that with the impeachment trial i think the fact that um we knew that he was going to get acquitted um and what we expected to happen happened again in the impeachment um shows that we're incredibly partisan the trump train and that trump wing is still not going to go anywhere and obviously republicans whether in the house or the senate um, still believe that a lot of their voting base might be aligned with Trump and are afraid to go against him, even out of office. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. I feel like it's kind of damned if they do, damned if they don't, you know? So the party really is between a rock and a hard place right now. It's like, do you condemn Trump and try to move on, but your minority base that you would kind of need all still seem to love him? So it's like, yeah, leave Trump and they're going to be mad and you probably will never win another major election again. Or you keep going with this and also you might not win another major election. Yeah. You know, it's 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 really not a good place to be in. And I feel like that's, you know, Mitch McConnell basically said that Trump is morally responsible for it. So, of course, in a very milk toast and somewhat sleazy way, he's like, yeah, I think Trump's guilty of this, but we're not going to I'm not going to vote guilty on this. And I think he. Actually, for once, I kind of understand him why he did this. He's really trying to get two things. He wants to be on the record condemning Trump, but he also knows that the party needs Trump, unfortunately. And I think you're right, as I thought it would be different. But from what I've kind of seen in history, these populist movements don't go away quickly. And I think we're seeing that. Yeah. um, Yeah. Unfortunately, again, because of how politically charged these trials are, um, the fact that we can pretty accurately predict what will happen, which is he's going to be impeached in the House and acquitted in the Senate twice now, um, it's a sign that what we're not what we're not getting is is I think a lot of people are used to trials that they see on t- TV and and, and, and spe- specifically criminal trials, and this is not that there is not a judge 
um, presiding over this trial. There is not a jury of peers. It's, you know, it's just the jury basically is, is the Senate. Uh, and again, when you have such close ties between, you know, senators and the past president, um, you know, Mitch McConnell, even though they hate each other now in the last few months, uh, Mitch McConnell was incredibly close with to the Trump White House for the last four years. Um, and, you know, Senator Lindsey Graham is an easy example. Ted Cruz. There's plenty of senators that are like buddies with the guy. So to to act like this is somehow in the same vein as a non, you know, a non a non partial jury of your peers in a criminal court. It's just not, it's not the case. And it's not what we're getting. Um, regardless of whether it should be or not it's just not what we're seeing so i think for context of people that are maybe new to this idea you know an impeachment trial is not a criminal trial um so the same the same kind of rules and the a a, a good one was i was listening to the the 538 podcast and they had a professor on who like you know studies constitutional law and she was saying that you know what we're seeing is the first draft of this historical record there's not much precedent for what's going on, and we still have a lot of questions about the impeachment process. One of the main ones is the burden of proof. Uh, the burden of proof we see in like a criminal trial, depending on the charge, is actually laid out of you know beyond a reasonable doubt for things like murder or you know significant you know like there's 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 layers of burdens of proof for different crimes. But in an impeachment trial, especially for one of like insurrection, there's no precedent for what that burden of proof is, and there's no requirement mm-hmm. to meet any burden of proof. So a senator can simply, you know, with very compelling evidence, can simply say, I don't think so, and that's what we're seeing is you have the American public believing he should be convicted. You have the American public overall, again, this is all Fox News and ABC polls, believing that the evidence was strong. I think something in the 60% thought the evidence was strong against Trump, and yet the senators um, didn't vote for it. And so, again, I, I, all I'm trying to say is don't expect a law and order <laughs> style trial with, with, with impeachment proceedings. It's political and completely so, and we're seeing it play out that way. Yeah, no, I, I, I definitely agree with that. It's unfortunate, but it's it's kind of the a the stake of where the nation's at. And I think you're right is that I think people like to sugarcoat what an impeachment is. Yeah, it's called an impeachment trial, but it's I mean, some of these guys aren't even lawyers. Some of these guys aren't even, you know, like th- this is not what they're just designed to do. And so it, it comes down to opinion, partisanship, allegiances, fear, I think, in the case of Trump. And yeah, I, I, I totally agree with you. And kind of on a side note of that. I really think this shows me that this might be the most damning example of why we need term limits Mm -hmm. because the only Republicans, like I've noticed a trend amongst the Republicans who voted guilty and, you know, Mitt Romney wealthy doesn't really seem to care about this job. Um, You had Adam Kinzinger, military guy, super intelligent. I'm sure he could get a job in cybersecurity or, you know, some national security, something like that. And, you know, who else was it? We had like uh, Richard Burr. He's retiring. Ben Sass has never cared about what the Republican Party thinks about him. I think we need more of these people who aren't afraid to lose their job because it's 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 kind of sad that these guys are just so afraid of the backlash that they don't really care. And I think that's just what we see here, you know, and yeah, they're they're probably afraid that that they're you know, there's threats to their family by some of this crazy mob that's been unleashed and just. The fact that, yeah, they like the power and the status of being in Congress and they don't want to lose it. And I think that's just kind of shitty. Excuse my language. Yeah, I, I, that's an interesting point. And I, I think before we get into like the end of the votes, I do want to talk a little bit about like some of the the original concerns around this impeachment trial and it, wh- uh, whether or not it was constitutional and how <laughs> that's not actually based in, 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 in precedent. Right. So one of the first things was, you know, Mitch McConnell claiming that, you know, he didn't want the January exception. He didn't want to. Uh, put a, a president on trial in his last moments of office, um, which I don't find is a good argument at all. Um, in mm. fact, one, if one, just based on like, you know, our feelings about that law, I think it's kind of stupid to say that and you can do anything in your last moments of office because you won't be held accountable for it because you're almost gone. That seems really counterproductive to me. I feel like that's a stupid idea. I think we should hold people accountable for whatever they do in their job at any time. Um, And then also based on legal precedent, we saw in the 1800s, I think it was a senator. Now, eventually senators were found to not be impeachable. But at the time, uh, or 1790, excuse me, early on, 1790, they found that it was appropriate 
that uh, Congress could impeach someone after they've left office, and they even cited the British impeaching their own parliamentary members after they've left office for various offenses. And so they said, look, you know, we, we want to be able to help hold our government employees accountable even after they've left office um, because it's important to, and it's symbolic, and it ensures, and it can be politically damaging. Um, I think it's, so like, even though what we're seeing is symbolic, it is, it is important to put on record that the American people and its representatives don't believe that Trump should have done these things and is, was impeached by the House. Um, and so the constitutionality of, oh, we can't impeach someone because it's the last few weeks of his, of his term is not based in any precedent. It seems like a stupid idea to me. And then now, you know, the idea that the charge itself, that an insurrection is not something that can be impeachable is also ridiculous because, again, the Constitution gives us a broad understanding of what high crimes and misdemeanors are, and I believe that armed insurrection should be included in that. So really breaking down the defense arguments against having this trial in the first place, um, they're not very strong arguments. Um, and then I think the, the, the only essential argument that the defense, that Trump's defense really rested on, on during the trial, after it was found to be constitutional to go ahead, after it was found that insurrection should be a charge, um, their defense was free speech. And I, I, I don't believe the free, absolutist free speech argument that, a, you know, I think that a private citizen, if a private citizen held a rally and told people to fight 20 to 25 times, uh, after explaining that their election had been stolen and that their government was illegitimate and then that mob went and committed violence, like a private citizen would have been held accountable. They're not protected by free speech um, in, in, in instances of inciting. And we, it's literally a crime. Yeah, oh, definitely, definitely. And so the, the first thing I want to say is, yes, I, I totally agree with you on the constitutional argument. I, I even know lawyers, conservative lawyers like Ben Shapiro, also think it's stupid like there's a lot of republicans who didn't agree with that argument sure. either of and and no yeah, I'm, I'm just saying this but yeah, yeah. um but i i totally agree with you too and the fact is <laughs> it was it was a failed argument mainly because the actual impeachment started in the house while he was still president right and then mitch mcconnell chose to wait and hold it off until until february and so then i was irritated when then he said well because trump has left office now and we're not going to do this it's like hey man it was you who decided to wait and yeah. now it's also you who's using this time argument to now say it doesn't count, so I'm not going to vote guilty. And I, yeah, exactly. There is precedent. There was that senator, yeah, back in the what late 1700s. And so it's happened before. It's not like it's something random. But I, I do agree with you about about the argument about free speech. I mean, even if we were going to go down that road, Trump is the president of the United States, or was the president of the United States. This is someone who doesn't just. He's not just a crazy guy who can go scream on. Sure on you know on times square and just have some people look at him he's the president he has the nuclear codes he had the official twitter and he has a platform and i i think that was what jamie raskin's argument who i by the way think did a great job especially compared to adam schiff in the first impeachment he did a great job i think and he he did a good job of kind of that thing it's like okay so you give your two weeks notice at work so you can burn down the building and not be held accountable for it like yeah. it's you you don't want that precedent and and also you know i think i think the democrats did a good job and the Republicans actually didn't seem to understand this was that it wasn't just about what happened on January 6th. It was the two months and actually even before the election in June and July when Trump said he wouldn't accept the results. It was going to be rigged. There was going to be fraud. And to me, they should have focused even more on that and less on actually January 6th, because even if Trump didn't say anything on January 6th, I still think it would have happened because he was a he was a marinating liar for the last four years. And it kind of culminated on that date. And that's like there's that great Atlantic article, you know, that talks about history will judge the complicit. And that's kind of what they talk about, especially inside of uh, what was it called, like the East, East Germany, you know, after the after the end of the World War Two stuff. And it talks about how basically this slow lying and this slow marinating of falsehoods usually culminates in things like this. And they use Lindsey Graham as an example in that. And yeah, I just think that this was going to happen either way. And I wish the Democrats focused more on that. Sorry, rant aside, but yeah. No, no, you may, you bring up a really good point about, you know, being complicit, right? Again, it's it's the idea that part of that, that uh, Atlantic article talked about how, you know, the one person who drifted away from the narrative, the one person who stayed absorbed in it, they both understood that the narratives being told to them were lies. They both understood, right? The, the idea that it, it wasn't like someone was like, 
persuaded one way and the other one was persuaded the other. They both had a basic understanding that the propaganda mm -hmm. that they were consuming was false, that the media narrative, the government narrative that was being portrayed was false. And yet one may remain complicit. And I think that's exactly what we see, like Lindsey Graham. Lindsey Graham has to know that Joe Biden legitimately won this election. He, the, the, you know what I mean? Like they know that they know that this happened, but they're complicit and they're willing to engage in these conspiracies because it's politically expedient for them. Um, and, you know, it helps with their radical Republican base. So, yeah, you bring up a very good point that and, and I think Trump as well. I really do think that, like, you know, he it was a political strategy to claim all these election fraud things. It's not like Trump legitimately believes this, even as as adamant as he is. I think I don't think he believes in anything. I think he just solely viewed it as a political strategy. And everyone around him had to have known that this was based in falsehoods. And yet they continued on. So and yet people like Lindsey Graham are determining the guilty or the guilt or innocence of Donald Trump in this trial. So it's not it's not surprising to me when we when it says 77 percent of Americans, regardless of party, view that this um, that senators voted on partisan politics. I mean, that's yeah, that's a that's a problem. Right. I mean, they're not supposed to. That's actually a huge problem. Um, I yeah, I think, though, that even though we could have predicted the end of this, which is the Senate acquitted him. Um, it is still important that it's, it's politically damaging. If you look at um, Andrew Jackson, who won an election and, and, and then within this um, or, I, or was impeached, but then acquitted by one vote in the 1800s, he ended up not getting his party's nomination the next year and then was kind of dead politically after that. So I, I think that strategically it's still important to put all this on blast, have this be on the news put the record down that he got impeached twice by the house, um, force Republicans to take a stand on this incitement, um, and then use this to like hit you in the face in a year or two in primaries, um, because you're on record either supporting it or not. And like <laughs> I said, like this is just bad news for the Republican party because now you have to decide between inciting insurrection or going against the Trump base who is relentless. Um, I, I think I think I think it's I think it's going to be politically damaging for Trump. I, I think after this impeachment trial and the capital insurrection, I do not think he will uh, play a major role as a candidate in the Republican Party anymore. Definitely, definitely, man. And I, I agree with you because I actually think that though I'm irritated that Mitch McConnell didn't vote guilty, I think even him just publicly saying that Trump was morally responsible for it will hold weight now. I do worry that even today, Trump has been, you know, releasing statements condemning Mitch McConnell and how the movement is going to be better than ever. I do worry that this is going to be around for a while, but I do think you're right, is that this will be politically feasible to use the fact that some of these senators who know better dis like still decided to go along with it, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I, I really quickly just wanted to touch on one more thing in that Atlantic article, because I, I think that was a really well, well done article, but it talks about it uses a really good example of how it started on day one of Trump's presidency, you know, with lying about the crowd sizes. And, and, and a lot of Republicans just kind of laughed it off, right? Because it's something small. It's kind of mundane. Who cares? But over time, it got worse and worse. The lies got bigger and they kind of kept going around. And there's a quote that says about Lindsey Graham. It says in the article, the built in vision of themselves as American patriots or as competent administrators or as loyal party members also created a cognitive distortion that blinded many Republicans. And I, and I think that's that's truly what happened. And unfortunately, how do you hold a Senate trial when that has happened, when that distortion is already long past um, fixable, in my opinion? And and yeah, so it's it, it's 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 not good. It's, it's really not good. And I, I I feel like there's an underbelly on the Republican side, especially right now. And I mean, I think there is somewhat on the left as well, but it's much worse on the right. And it's this kind of authoritarian underbelly that the far right likes uh and it's getting more mainstream on the right. And that's why I was really hoping that some of these people would be patriots. And yes, seven of them were. But the fact that this is a diminishing party that is slowly and slowly becoming more and more minority, they're scared and they want to find a way to hold on to power. And I don't think at least history would tell us that ends up well. It does seem like longer term, like big, like big, big picture that like with the success of Obama, who was a very special and unique candidate right highly inspirational very well liked 
um, the I would say the best Democratic candidate in decades uh, compared to their milk toast otherwise. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that like I think the Republican ethos was or, or, or idea was just like so it threatened so threatened by someone so inspirational and popular that like Donald Trump was like a a a cornered dog getting in a final bite, relashing out. But you're right. Like I, I don't see a platform that's not inclusive for gay people. That's not minority driven. Right. That's, that's in very recently, you know, like, <laughs> like, a, you know, avidly using rhetoric against Mexican immigrants. Right. I don't see that party surviving in the long run. Um, even though it's getting kind of a, a dead cat bounce. Um, and I, I think that, I mean, it's like like I've said it before. Like this is the bed that Republicans have made, and now they're sleeping in it. Um, but overall, though, I mean, we're 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 I think we're going to have to see a shift in in the Republican Party. And I knew I do know that there was something like a hundred or so uh, Republican officials and and um, like strategists that got on a Zoom call to try and start a third party. I saw that mm-hmm. that ABC article that showed that a majority of Americans wanted Trump convicted also showed that, that it's like the highest polling ever for wanting a third party. Let me see if I can get the actual number. But um, uh, yes, the poll by Fox News. Sorry. Fox News poll conducted January 21st through th- February 2nd indicates that 70% of independ- independents want a, the, a, a third party. 63% of Republicans feel the same way. Um, whereas just last September, before the election, only 40% of Republicans wanted a third party. Um, but I don't know if that's a third party to go back to the middle or a third party to be some crazy Trump thing, right? So we, I don't know if that if that's a call for a third party that we want or not, but it's just going to show, it just shows that there's actual statistics backing up this idea that there's a major, major schism in the Republican party. And there's a big, big drive to kind of throw out what's already been done and create something new. Well, what's ironic because I could actually see the Republican party almost splitting into three parties. <laughs> you know, you, you would have the, the kind of me, the, you know, the kind of never Trump or moderate Republicans kind of, I guess you could put into the Bush era kind of neocons, like a lot of those, those hundred plus people that, you know, are looking to start a third party. And then you would have the Patriot Party, right? And then you would just kind of have the milk toast ones that are left over. And that, that, that does not bode well for having a strong two party system. But yeah, like it, it, it makes me wonder, you know, I mean, it, through history, there have been political realignments, you know, when the Whig yeah. Party fell out of power and the Republican Party gained power. Do you think that maybe we are going to see another realignment? Because it's been a while. I wonder because, you know, I mean, the realignment I'm seeing is that upper educated suburban white people are becoming more left leaning. Mm-hmm. Um, right. So like as far as realignment of demographics, because I like when I think of a realignment, like the Southern strategy, which turned white Democrats in the South into white Republicans. Right. That's a huge, big shift. That's like, a, you know, a major demographic block, whereas the demographic block shift like we did talk a little bit about. There's an, a little bit of an increase in Hispanic votes for Republicans for Trump. That is a little bit of increase for a black vote for Trump, but nothing substantial. I don't see a major democratic shift away. I, I, I see the shift. I see the the shift being upper educated middle class whites mm-hmm. leaving the Republican Party. Right, Pe- people like you, moderate conservatives, well educated, well adjusted, not 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 susceptible to, you know, um, pop, pop like conspiracy based populism. Right, they're going to go away from the Republican Party, and and the the poor uneducated whites that are Trump's base. Are just doubling down. So yeah, the shift is not. If, if there's any shift to a third party, it's not going to be. It's going to be away from what Trump is. I think not towards it. Yeah, I would. I would probably agree as well. And I. I mentioned earlier, you know, that populist movements do stick around sometimes after that leader is out. But sometimes it's really hard for other people to, you know, caress or control that same energy. You know, like they're talking about Lara Trump in North Carolina. They're talking about Holly and Ted Cruz trying to fill that void. And I don't really know if they could particularly do it. Like, there's a good example of Silvio, I think it's Berlusconi. He was actually kind of like pre-Trump. He was, the, he was the leader of Italy, I think it was back in the late 90s. And he was a businessman, corrupt, 
against the establishment. He wanted to represent ordinary people. And now he's had a lot of um, court issues and investigations into his taxes and stuff. But no one else ever followed him. He just kind of remained this cult figure. And yeah, he has a hard following inside of Italy. But no one was really ever to follow him. And I kind of think of Chavez in, in, in Venezuela as well. Like, Nicolas Maduro followed him, but he's literally bringing the country down around him. But there's yeah. still this Hugo Chavez energy inside of the country. And I, I kind of wonder if Trumpism only works if it's Trump. Like, do, do you really think the base would like Lara Trump? Like, not even a blood relative to Trump, who is clearly just a rich elite woman, you know, but she has his name. I don't know. Like, do you really think that Trumpism without Trump could even last anyways? I don't. I don't. I think he's the head of the snake as far as, <laughs> as I mean, well, as far as the Patriot Party thing and the, the really the Trump wing. I mean, again, I, I, I think longer term um, misinformation and, and propaganda is to, is to blame for the radicalization of the, the American right. Um, but I think as far as the immediate effects um, and the, the political power in the immediate future, I don't see Trump being that influential. Um, or, 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 or being able to carry the torch along. Um, he's pretty old. So let's say he even tries to run. Like one is, I, ah, he might, he might try and run in like 2024, but I don't see him doing that well. Um, I think if he tried to pass it on to one of his kids or, or relatives or associates, they don't have that same flair or like, uh, frankly, like, quick comebacks and humor that Donald Trump does like he's Donald Trump is weirdly charismatic in a in a in a asshole kind of way but his <laughs> his sons are just assholes they're not charismatic they're just assholes and i i, I think you i i think you're right that like i i were i i don't see the, the Trump thing lasting without Trump i see radicalization of the right continuing but i don't see them being as organized and politically successful as they were the last 4 years yeah, the the only thing I worry about is that if you have kind of the more sane people leaving the Republican Party and it's kind of left with people that either are completely lost to misinformation, potentially QAnon supporters, I, I worry that someone like, a, say, a John Hawley, who he, he even wrote a paper back in back in law school where he was talking about how it's all about controlling the masses and telling them what they want to hear. And I just worry that that Trump, you're right. Yeah, Trump's 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 kind of funny. Like, if he wasn't president, th there's some funny stuff he says. Like, he's you're you're right. He's weirdly charismatic. But I worry that a Holly who is way smarter than like no offense, but he's way smarter than a lot of the people that voted for Trump. And I'm worried that he could use that to his advantage to you know keep gerrymandering or keep fighting for this minority rule inside of the country, which could be dangerous. It's not Trumpism, but it's almost like something Trumpism brought out. You know what I mean? Well, you're certainly right. I mean, if you look at what's what's going on after this elections happened um there's commissions and especially the right the the republican states that trump lost so arizona uh, georgia there's like commissions to try and change voting uh, laws especially like uh limiting mail-in registration trying to get like limiting getting the ability to get a mail-in ballot uh, at, uh close to the election date itself um so they're trying little things to like uh, in their eyes, avoid what happened last time, which was a big influx of mail-in voting because of coded and um, a lot more increased participation. They want to avoid that. So you're seeing that there is actual efforts taken by the GOP on the state level to try and like, you know, limit election access. Uh, I don't personally think that's good or healthy <laughs> for democracy, but, but it, you're right that they're just not going to, they're not going to roll over they're not going to just roll over. You're right. They're going to fight tooth and nail. And, um, and, and especially the GOP at the state level, including like, you know, look at what they're, they, they, they censured, um, um, uh, Miss Cheney. They, they're, they're like censuring, um, any GOP that votes for impeachment. Um, speaking of cancel culture. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I do see like at the state level, like they're trying to get revenge and trying to do things to avoid the problem in the future. So it certainly is a, a real threat to people's, uh, you know, voting rights and political participation. But I don't see it as a long term winning strategy. Sure. Maybe you might take back one Senate seat in Georgia in the primary because you did a little, you know, mail in ballot removal. But long term, Georgia is going to go blue, I think. Like long term, Texas is, is going to go purple. Not maybe four years, but in eight and 12. And if you're Mitch McConnell, well, maybe not Mitch McConnell. He's old as hell. But if you're Ben Sass, if you're, you know, if you're Ben Sass, you're thinking, yo, how does the GOP survive 20 years, let alone four? 
<laughs> yeah, 20, 20 years. I, I don't think that's even fathomable at the rate they're going at. But yeah. by the time we get to twenty forty one, there's going to be like five Republicans left. If, yeah, if, 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 if they double down on this QAnon stuff, I would say yeah. <laughs> um, you know, and and thinking of some of the senators, I I want to just give a quick shout out to Bill Cassidy of Louisiana because Louisiana is Trump territory, uh, and and he. That was bold of him. And I, I, I like what he's doing because he's one of those 10 senators who also wanted to meet with Biden about the stimulus. Mm -hmm. And I know that Biden didn't agree with them and he didn't end up listening to them. But you, to me, it was an effort. You know, Mitt Romney, Toomey and some of these other guys, it was an effort. And we need more of that. But of course, these guys are now, you know, strangers in a foreign land. They don't have a party anymore, in my opinion. Like Richard Burr is retiring. You know, Lisa Murkowski, like Susan Collins. These people are going to be just completely castigated. Yeah. yeah, but I I like it, man. Like Bill Cassidy was a shocker to me. He was definitely someone I was not expecting, but he clearly wants to find some sort of unity. And when he said, "I voted guilty because Trump's attorneys couldn't convince me that he wasn't guilty," I'm like, "Thank you. Someone was honest." <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, good. I mean, I, it does to me. It sounds like uh, I'm not too familiar with the man, but it sounds to me like he voted his conscience. Uh, I'm interested to see if there is political ramifications because, again, you know, we're we're talking about how most people believe and i do as well that people voted politically save a few um so i'm interested to see bills like will he will he be able to you know run again and win again in louisiana if it's a, if it's still trump country is he do you know when he's up for re-election is it soon or because i mean look, let me let me take a look because i know that like ben sass has like six years and so he's up for again so he might be like if you have four to six years left on your term i mean you can probably weather the storm right but if you're up for election in a year or two you're that's the trump base it is going to still be around so i'm interested it's i don't know if bill cassie's up soon but regardless it does sound like he voted his conscience and uh good i'm that's one out of a hundred um <laughs>